um, the number one thing to do is, is be in prayer. Um, secondarily as well, just uh, we want to encourage people to contribute financially. I was talking with Dave last night. Um, if anybody is interested in contributing, um, you guys can see him over at the info table or find him after, um, after the service or talk to Malie, and we can get you guys set up with that. All of the contributions go directly to the kids and the ministry. They have um, uh, funding from, on their own, and so they want to just encourage you guys to um, be participant as well. And so I want to encourage you guys in that as well. Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles. Uh, we're going to jump into uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm very excited to, to be uh, finishing out the study here. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is uh, finishing up all the different instructions and encouragements that he's giving to Timothy. Um, he's finishing out the instructions for uh, what Timothy's supposed to be doing and looking out for. And next week, we are going to be uh, praying through a few of the key topics that are uh, found in 2 Timothy. And right now, we're kind of uh, seeing Paul's closing, closing thoughts here. And so uh, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 22, the end of the, um, the section there. Um, let's go ahead and read that now. now. So, verse 9. Be diligent to come to me quickly, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Crescens for Galatia, Titus for Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. And Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. Bring the cloak that I left at Carpus at Troas, left with Carpus at Troas when you come, and the books, especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first offense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, and so the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesphorus. <laughs> Arasta stayed in Corinth, but Trophimus I have left in Milcus sick. Militus sick. <laughs> Do your utmost to come before winter. Uh, Eubulus greets you as well as Prudence, Linus, Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit. Uh, be with your spirit. Grace with you. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray as we uh, dive in here. Lord, we just want to thank you for the opportunity we have to uh, jump into the word. Um, Lord, we are excited to be able to have this relationship, this connection with you. And Lord, as we're looking at what Paul is communicating to Timothy here, we see um, the, the final words of somebody who is uh, lonely, who is um, abandoned, who has ministry on his mind, and yet, Lord, still praises you, still gives glory to you for uh, being everything for him. And so we want to thank you for that, uh, with that example through Paul, and for the application that we can see for our own lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, if you guys have your uh, bulletins, there's an outline in there. You guys are welcome to follow along uh, with some of the notes that I have. Um, <clears throat> there's a few things that I want to kind of talk about here as Paul is, uh, Paul is communicating his final thoughts. Um, there's a few kind of key things kind of mixed in with a lot of just kind of final notes. You can see sort of the general theme here. Paul's kind of wrapping up his letter, and he's writing now, don't forget this, don't forget that, bring this person here. Also, I'm pretty cold, it's wintertime, bring my coat. Um, he's communicating all these little things here, and kind of hidden in the, in the midst of it, he's communicating a, a couple of key central themes that I think are really important for us to understand uh, as we are, are walking very, a, very similar, uh, a very similar life where we have uh, Christ within us. We're facing difficult trials and persecutions. Um, not many of us have, have experienced the same things that Paul has uh, experienced. He's experienced quite a bit for the sake of Christ. Um, but some of us have the opportunities to experience some of these things, and regardless of that, um, we still suffer from some of the um, similar mindsets and still have the same presence of the Lord within us. So first of all, Paul is communicating here that he is alone. Um, and that's kind of the first point that I have on that outline here. Paul, Paul is alone. Um, he feels sort of neglected. He feels that there are not a lot of people around him. He has denied the uh, the basic fellowship of Christians that we all get to experience, and I think a lot of us take for granted. I know I definitely do. Um, it's, I just kind of don't really even realize the significance of that blessing that I have, that we have 
the constant um, fellowship and encouragement of other believers. We have that here at church and, and also all throughout the week. I live with the Bible College, and so we wake up and we have devotions and we have all the, all the people that are, are uh, praying and encouraging, going to classes, and all these things are very um, edifying. And Paul is communicating here that he's alone. He doesn't have these things. And um, Paul, in the midst of him, uh, his, uh, his loneliness here, he gives Timothy um, two instructions. He gives Timothy two instructions in the midst of his loneliness here. Um, in verse 9, he tells him, be diligent to come to me quickly. Be diligent to come to me quickly. And he's, he, he's communicating that he wants this fellowship. He recognizes the necessity of it and wants it desperately. And so he tells uh, Timothy to come to him quickly. quickly. He sets up a few different reasons why this is important and why he wants uh, Timothy to come to him. Um, first of all, um, he, he mentions a guy named uh, Demas, and he says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed for Thessalonica. Now, we see Demas a couple times. If it's the same Demas, we see him in Colossians chapter 4 and in Philemon um, verse 24. In those two sections, we see um, Demas noted as sort of a close friend, somebody who's a companion to, uh, to Paul in ministry. And yet here we see him described as um, having, having kind of fallen away from that and instead being in love with the world. He, um, he's described as, as, uh, as loving the things of this world. And 1 John chapter 2 talks about this. This is a pretty sig- significant departure for Demas from what he was once before in ministry and now where he is here in chapter 4 of 2 Timothy. In 1 John chapter 2, we have instructions where it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, and the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. This is uh, 15 through 17 there, those two verses, um, 15 and 17. And, and what, what I see here, I was talking with um, a, few of the, um, a few of the guys. We have a, a morning Bible study on Saturdays, and we've been going through First John. We were going through uh, chapter 2 yesterday morning, and we were kind of just talking about the, the interesting things of what this really means. What, is, what does it mean to uh, not love the world? A lot of people, especially Christians, will use this as sort of an, a, a reason not to engage with the world. Saying, well, it's like, well, I, I only need to love Christ and the body of Christ. You know, I don't need to engage with people. I don't need to witness um, the people that are down at the bike path. I don't need to concern myself with that. Um, there's somebody who needs some help over here. It's okay. I'm not going to love the world. And that's not at all what Paul is talking about um, in, when, he's, when he's talking about Demas um, loving the world. He's talking about these, these fleshly desires, the things that are so temporary and that are not lasting. And that's what John is cha- talking about in his second chapter um, where he's saying that the things of the world, don't, don't participate in these things, don't love these things. Don't let these be your motivations and desires. And interestingly, uh, Demas has fallen away. He's, he's gotten distracted from the ministry with um, the pleasures of the world, the focus of the temporary. And Paul notes that, that it has drawn him away, and it's distracted him, so much so that Paul now does not have that fellowship. And uh, Demas has gone away to Thessalonica. He communicates as well that um, a lot of his friends have less, left him. He talks about Crescens and Titus and uh, Tychicus. These three guys have uh, gone off on different, um, different ministry things. Um, it's interesting to note that these guys um, aren't noted as sinful for not being with Paul. Paul, in, in a couple of situations, actually sent these guys um, to be out in ministry. And so Paul, Paul recognizes, you know, for the sake of the ministry, it's more important than my own comfort um, for my own, um, my own needs here. But uh, nonetheless, Paul still is, uh, is, would love to have people, and so he's recognizing that he's alone here. And he says that only Luke is with him. Only Luke is with him. He also communicates in, uh, in verse 11. He says, uh, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me in ministry. And here we see that Paul is communicating just a couple of, of things to bring with uh, Timothy. He wants Mark to come in Colossians chapter 4. Um, Mark is noted as being one of Paul's close friends as well. And in Acts chapter 15, um, we, we see uh, Mark as well, although in this situation we see uh, Paul have a disagreement with Barnabas over whether or not to take Mark with them on a missions trip. And so we see sort of a disagreement. Paul, Mark has, um, is not up, to, not up to scratch, according to Paul. And um, Paul and Barnabas actually uh, go on different different missions trips because of the disagreement, and yet here we see that, uh, that Paul has, uh, 
I, I, I'm assuming somewhere reconciled with Mark and, and uh, figured out some of these differences. And so now he's, he's saying he wants to reunite with him. He wants to have him here. Um, Mark has, uh, has proven his worth here. And he wants to, uh, Timothy to bring his cloak and his books and parchment. And I think that both of these things here are fairly inconsequential to, the, uh, to what Paul is really wanting, is the, the deeper need of, of fellowship. Um, but all that to say is that Paul, Paul wants this. He wants this fellowship, and he recognizes that need. And when I think, think of this kind of a thing, I, I just want to communicate the, the necessity that we should have in our hearts for this kind of a thing. A lot of us come here thinking that this is, it's important because of the ritual. It's important because of it's what Christians do to be here in fellowship. Um, but we are designed to need it. We are designed to uh, thrive in it and to grow in it to grow closer to God and to worship God uh, through this kind of an environment. Paul sees that clearly. And so he, he continues on with this idea of, his, um, of, uh, of the abandoned apostle, the idea that he is alone, um, by talking about a, a guy named Alexander. In verse 14, he talks about this guy. He says, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his work. You also must be aware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. And in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, in, in the first book that, uh, that, Tim, that Paul writes to Timothy, uh, he talks about a guy named Alexander as well. It could be the same guy. Um, in that situation, Alexander is alongside a man named Hymenaeus, and they are in a, um, a temporary excommunication for um, not following uh, the... Uh, not following the gospel message of Christ. And so they have been temporarily removed from the, the church in order to, um, to learn and to better understand the, uh, the need for repentance. And if that's the case here, then, then, that's, then that kind of explains a little bit of why Paul is talking about um, Alexander. But it could be an entirely different guy as well. Um, in Troas, where um, Timothy is supposed to pick up his cloak, uh, Paul's cloak, in Troas there's a strong um, coppersmith's guild there, and so it could very much be that Alexander the coppersmith is a person that's in Troas, and Paul is, is warning of, him of Alexander as he's sending him to Troas to get his cloak, and so perhaps that's the, the context of, um, of where he's from. But regardless, um, the, the response that Paul has um, towards Alexander is a little bit interesting. His response is that Paul prays for justice. Paul prays for, for justice in this situation. Um, in verse uh, uh, 14, he says, May the Lord repay him according to his works. And so what is, what is Paul saying here with this? What is, what is Paul asking God of with, um, with this prayer? May the Lord repay him for his works. It reminds me um, significantly of some of the Proverbs as well as what uh, Hebrews chapter 10 says. Um, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 30 through 31, it says, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And the, it's very interesting, the very interesting way that Paul is communicating here is he's ultimately saying that, that uh, Alexander is opposing this ministry. He's oppositional to the message of Christ. Um, he's actively trying to hinder the work that Paul and Timothy um, are doing for the advancement of the gospel. And Paul communicates and says, the Lord's going to judge. You know, may the Lord judge him appropriately. And there's an interesting, um, uh, it's just kind of interesting the way that uh, this sounds like what Paul is warning Timothy about in Ephesus is with regards to the false teachings in his city. You know, it's very similar to what Paul's been talking about to Timothy for the rest of this book here. Paul is warning Timothy this whole time about these people that are, uh, presenting an oppositional, oppositional stance, an oppositional message, and he's saying, you need to watch out for this. Deal with this appropriately. Um, protect the church. And here he seems like he's saying something very similarly. Um, he has resisted our work greatly. Paul communicates uh, one more thing regard, with regards to his, uh, him being alone. He says that, uh, that he stood trial alone. In uh, verse 16, it says, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. <clears throat> May it not be charged against them. This is, uh, this is saying, this is probably the, the preliminary hearing before Caesar, uh, right, right as he was becoming imprisoned, uh, this first hearing. Um, no one was with him, everybody forsook him. And the interesting thing here is that now he's talking about brothers, um, brothers in Christ, uh, men and women who are helping him in ministry, and these people uh, weren't there for him when he was standing trial. 
And interestingly, Paul responds to this situation very differently than he responds to the situation with Alexander. He says, may it not be charged against him. And what Paul is, is looking for in this scenario is he is, he is expressing his self-sacrificial desire to be at peace with his brothers. Um, even though the, they abandon him, um, he doesn't want this uh, charge held against him. Um, very similar to what, what Stephen said in Acts chapter 7 when he was being martyred, um, as well as uh, in Luke chapter 23 when Jesus um, said something very similar. Um, and even in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see um, Paul has his own commands given to, um, to the church in Corinth about, about this, uh, this forgiving nature, what that really looks like. And the, the cool thing to me is I see a very, a very strong difference between uh, these two different people, these people that were with Paul um, and abandoned him, that, that left him uh, when he was on trial, and then this guy, Alexander. Um, we see Alexander... God's, uh, Paul says, may the Lord repay him. And as far as these forsakers, these people that were with Paul, his, his uh, Christian brothers, he says, may it not be charged against him. And so I was kind of wrestling with that. Why would Paul communicate two very different responses uh, to these different, these different situations? And as I was looking at it, I, I came to the conclusion that the, the difference in scenarios has very much to do with, uh, with where the offense took place and how, what kind of offenses are taking place. In the second situation, um, these guys abandon Paul, and it's sort of a personal offense. Um, it's a personal against, against, uh, offense against Paul, and he wants to express that ready, readiness to forgive. He wants to express that desire to be reconciled with them and to not have uh, uh, personal grievances with other people. He wants to have that good standing. And yet with Alexander, he's noted as attacking the ministry. He's noted as bringing uh, an opposition to the word of God, pulling away people from the word of God. And all throughout 2 Timothy here, uh, Paul is saying that these people are going to rise up, these false teachers are going to rise up out of the church. They're going to pull away you. They're going to pull away the people that are, that are listening to Timothy's message, and they're going to be uh, deceived by these false teachers, these false teachings, these heresies. And so in this situation, Paul is warning against Alexander, and he's saying that that, that is a, a very different situation than a personal grievance against himself. And it, it's interesting because this kind of brings me to, to the point number five under, under the first section here. That is that pastors must protect the flock. Pastors must protect the flock. Um, there's a huge contrast between Paul's response to those who wronged him personally and those who wronged the flock, those who damage and seek to destroy the flock. In Acts chapter 20, uh, we have instructions given to, uh, to leaders here. In Acts chapter 20, we have instructions given to leaders. And in 28 through 31, it says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood, for I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. And uh, this is, this is uh, being communicated to the church, saying that, that after I leave, after Jesus leaves, there's going to be people going to come in. They're going to rise up within the church. There's going to be people that are claiming the name of Christ and are going to be pulling away and separating, tearing apart the body of Christ. And this is why division is dealt with so significantly in the Bible. In Titus chapter 3, verse 10, it says, Re Reject a divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. And this, uh, this admonition is a warning, right? It's a warning against these people. And it's a very different scenario versus a, a personal grievance where how many times are we supposed to forgive, right? Seven times... Seven times 70, That's, uh, that means as, as many times um, as they're asking for forgiveness. Um, as many times as there is repentance, there's supposed to be forgiveness and reconciliation. Uh, but in this situation, we're seeing something very different from a personal offense taking place. Paul is warning Timothy about somebody who is attacking the ministry. And these kinds of situations are dealt with um, in a very different way. I love the way that Paul recognizes that, that necessity for um, for protection, because the, the fact is, is that we as a church, we need protection. 
we need to be prayed up. We need to be recognizing that, um, that people are trying to draw us away. And when we look at the, the context of, um, of, uh, of Second Timothy, the, the church that is, you know, 2,000 years ago, it feels like there's a very different, a different setting. A very, we're, not, you know, we're not susceptible to these kinds of heresies, and yet just very much are, uh, just as much. Um, I see it all over America where uh, men have, have come up into leadership and they're, they're teaching things that uh, sound good, sound wonderful and pleasing to the ear, and yet they're very destructive for the church. So Paul warns against this as he is communicating that he is alone, that he wants this fellowship. He's also in the midst of that warning, um, Timothy. But he moves right away into uh, sort of a, the flip side of this. He does this every single time. He communicates his own situation, the dire straits that he's in, all the different persecutions he's uh, suffered, all the different persecutions that Timothy's going to suffer or that Christians are called to suffer. And yet, in the midst of all that, through all of that, he gives this encouragement um, about who God is. And he communicates four different truths about who God is here in this context right now. And all four of them relate to God's uh, ability to be with us, his ability to um, hold us up. He first of all uh, communicates that God stands with us. God stands with us. Um, he says in verse 17, But the Lord stood with me and strengthened, with me, strengthened me. And in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, they use the same verbiage that the Lord stood with them, that he was with them when they go to war. In Matthew chapter 28, um, Jesus communicates that, uh, that he is, uh, the Holy Spirit is with us when we are in ministry. He stands alongside us in ministry. And in Hebrews chapter 13, it says that we don't need to worry about worldly security because we have, because we have the security of the Lord with us, standing with us. And so these, these, this, uh, this sort of gives us the picture of somebody that's watching over us, constantly there to look out for us, constantly there to protect us, who's there to preserve us. He communicates that God strengthens us. God stands with us and he strengthens, strengthens us. <laughs> and he gives, a, he gives the reason why this is. It's not so that we can be bold in ourselves or so that we can look great. God doesn't build me up and give me strength so that I can you know, look awesome and be a, a, a firm leader just for the sake of being that. Um, Paul communicates why he does this. Uh, he says in verse 17, so that the message might be preached fully through me. And that all the Gentiles might hear. God gives us strength and he stands with us so that the message will be preached. We are equipped by God to do God's work. And I love that there's sort of this complete package on how and why God strengthens and is with us. He does it for his own glory. He does it for the sake of the ministry. Which is something we need to understand and apply to our lives when we receive God's blessing. If we're if receiving something from God, we have a gift from God... It's for a definitive purpose, for a purpose of advancing God's kingdom, for the purpose of, of edifying the body, building up um, God's church, expanding God's church, bringing people into that relationship with God. And if you are on the front lines of ministry, if you are suffering persecution, if you are uh, engaging with people uh, for the sake of Christ and it's draining, if it is exhausting and it... it makes you feel like you don't have anything more to give or you're tired, which all those things happen. They're very, very much a real part of ministry. We can rely upon God's presence with us, his strengthening presence with us to provide that necessary, um, necessary endurance. Paul moves on from this idea of, of God's presence with us and talks about how God protects us. Number three, God protects us. Um, he says in verse uh, in verse 17 as well, the latter half, uh, he says that I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And he says in verse 18, and the Lord will deliver me from every work, evil work, and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. Paul recognizes that God protects him, not just from physical things, because that's a, a component. He says, you know, out of the mouth of the lion, uh, there's, there's definitely a physical protection taking place, but more specifically, he's talking about this, uh, this protection from the evil one and the way uh, the evil works that Satan is trying to do to discourage and distract us from ministry, to tear us apart. He protects us from these things. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, one of those verses I have listed there, it talks about how we are protected from temptation, how we, um, God always provides a way for us to stand in that. By his strength, we are able to stand up against temptation. In 2 Thessalonians 3, we have protection from Satan. In Psalm chapter 5, we sing for joy because of that protection that we have. It's something that we, we turn around and we glorify God for. Don't let that, <laughs> don't let that mean, though, to you that you aren't going to suffer. Because the fact is, is that Jesus says we are going to suffer. Paul communicates it right here with his own life. Jesus communicates it in, in Luke chapter 21. It says that some of us are even going to be put to death. Some of us are even going to be put to death for our faith and for our, our service for the advancement of the kingdom. And so this protection is ultimately a, uh, more importantly, even than the, the physical protection, it's, it's the spiritual and emotional protection. I love the, the picture of God holding us in, the, in his hand, right? And we have this relationship with, the, with him, and we're on the front lines of ministry, getting attacked by Satan because of the advancement of the gospel. And yet, despite all that, God holds us in his hand, and nothing can tear us from his hand. Nothing that Satan could ever do could pull us away and could... Uh, could damage us and say, you know, I'm, nope, you're, you're out of God's hands. You are out of his protection, and I've destroyed you. None of those things could ever be, uh, could ever be true. And I love, I love that, that mental image of being able to uh, rest firmly in God's hands. God preserves us. That latter half of verse, uh, verse 18, God preserves us. And it's interesting because he says that he'll preserve us for his heavenly kingdom. And again, not talking about physical protection, but rather giving us the endurance uh, and the, uh, the preservation of our soul to bring us into that eternal relationship with him. Um, Philemon, or, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 1, 6 uh, talks about the sanctification process and how um, God will finish his work in our hearts. He's going to continue to sanctify us, continue to, to mold us into the image of his son. And so that, that's a pre, uh, preservation that's taking place. And John chapter 10 is where it talks about um, nothing being able to snatch us from, uh, from God's hands. Um, Paul's joy and peace in this scenario is, is evident. Um, it, it's obvious to, to us here that, uh, and as well to Timothy, that Paul, despite all the situations that he's facing, despite all the loneliness, despite all the persecution, um, he still considers uh, it just complete joy and peace to be where he's at. And he's communicating that through the fact that he's like, God's with me. God strengthens me and protects me. He's preserving me. He's already protected me from so much, and he's preserving me for his heavenly kingdom. And we can see his response here. He says that he's just praising him. He says, to him be glory forever and ever. And he's just so excited. I can almost picture Paul just like writing it, and he's like getting faster and faster. And faster. And he's like, God stands with us, and he strengthens us, and he protects us, and he preserves us. Glory to be him, to him forever and ever. He's just excited about this. Paul's joy and peace is evident. And I think that the same, the same principle of peace um, applies no, no matter what the situation is. There's no, there's no situation in life that God's peace cannot be present with us in. And uh, Paul, Paul is experiencing a, a lot of significant, um, significant persecution, and yet he still has this peace with God. He still has this peace with God. Um, a few weeks ago, I was... Um, I, uh, my day off Tuesday, I was going to go to town and, and do some errands, and uh, I had an opportunity to um, experience God's peace regardless of, uh, of difficult circumstances. Um, I grabbed Jewel and, and the girls, and we got into our, our car, and we were heading into town, and uh, on the way on the bypass, um, it felt like our tire, right tire, was flat, and so we pulled off to the side. It was kind of going, like, lugging a little bit and bumping, and uh, when we pulled over, the car died, and so I got out, checked the, uh, the tires. They were fine, but... Um, uh, had trouble getting the car to turn back on. Finally, it did, but then the engine was like, like rocking real hard, right? And I was like, all right, well, I guess we're turning around, you know? And so we, we get, go, go back up, to the, up the bypass, get back here, and, um, the, you know, the engine's rocking real hard. We get up to the, to the turn in there, and it dies like as soon as we get onto the dirt, and we just kind of coast into the, into the gate there. So I try to get it started. It won't start, and so I get out and kind of push it and turn the wheel and get it going down the hill to uh, and park it down over over by our cabin, and so we're like, all right, well, I'll deal with that later. Let's, uh, let's get into my car. Uh, we'll move the car seats over, and we'll go into town. So we did. We, we got them into, got the car seats into our car, got everyone resituated, went into town, got some McDonald's, and we're heading back out on the road, and um, we're passing by that place that used to be L&L, &L, and, um, and are heading, heading towards Lahui, um, and I shift from second to third, 
And when it goes into third, it goes ring, you know, zip line where I'm going into first gear. And I'm like, oh, no, like, dummy, that's not what you're supposed to do. And I'm like, no, it is. I'm, I actually am going into third. I'm, I don't know what's wrong with it. So I try again going to third, and, uh, and it, it kills it. It just clunk, like, clunks out. And so then it's like uh, kind of slow into a stop as the, uh, the engine's still like turning as I'm in, in third gear. And I'm like, oh, no, this can't be good. So we pull off to the side there. And I call John, and he, uh, he comes over and, and um, takes us home with, um, with uh, my third car, which we were going to give to Ben and Rihanna. Anyways, the, um, <laughs> the third car. <laughs> and, and he, he, you know, uh, we, we drive home in that, and John takes a look at the car, and I come back over with the truck, and we end up getting it towed back, and we spend the day working on it. And, uh, but I remember getting in, into, the, into that, that third car, and I was uh, getting it started up, and I look over at Jewel, and I'm like, wouldn't it be funny if this car broke down on the way home? And she looked at me, and she says, that would not be funny. I was like, oh. and uh, yeah, so I, I guess maybe that wouldn't be funny. Um, but the thing was, is that at that moment, in, in that situation right there, and all through every other step, yeah, it was a little bit of a bummer to, uh, to have to go through these things, um, the, the, the different situations that are going on with the car. We've always had island cars, and, um, and that's just kind of life. But uh, I, I, I kid you not, at every point, everything that was going on, I was just like, this is great. This is awesome. And the reason why is because I saw it as a very real opportunity to test my peace, to test my joy. No matter what the circumstance was, no matter what it, it is, I can know that God's got it. You know, there's some sort of a, of a reason for this. And even if we don't ever find out what that is, we can still just have joy knowing that God has provided so much for us. And uh, <clears throat> we got back home just fine, and, and later on in the day, we were heading out to go get some lunch, and uh, the girls were napping, and John was listening uh, to the girls, and Jewel and I went down, and, uh, and we got back onto the bypass with that third car, and as we were heading down the bypass, <laughs> the car starts squealing real bad, right? Like, like the brakes are engaged, you know, um, and I'm just like pushing through it, and it's going, Ree! and we get down to the bottom, bottom of that hill, and it's going, Ree! And uh, it stops, the, the squeaking stops. I'm like, oh gosh, are the brakes out? So I'm like testing it real quick. And yeah, the brakes are working. And so like I keep going slowly and I'm like, all right, all right, it's fine. And so I don't know what was wrong with that car, but it seems to be running all right now. <laughs> yeah, take it to a mechanic. <laughs> that's that's absolutely, uh, absolutely right. Well, uh, on that note, John and, uh, and Micah have been helping me the last couple weeks and have been looking at the cars we're waiting on a part for the, uh, for the Jeep, so uh, hopefully that'll get resolved. Um, but I, I got the bad news um, about the, uh, the white car. I'm going to explain it in as much technical ability as I can. Um, uh, the car's dead. That's about, that's about all I understand. Something about the engine and then the engine not working, and now it's just, yeah. So, like, that's, that's, that's it. John, John used a lot more eloquence, um, but I, I just can't really get it so well. So... So now we're, uh, we're trying to figure out what to do about that. But I was, I was uh, talking with Malie um, about the situation with her car a couple weeks later, and I was just reminded again the fact that, that none of that matters. None of that matters compared to the peace and the joy that we can have with God, no matter the circumstance. And as I think about the, the situation, what's going to happen with the cars, it's like, yeah, there's difficulties there. Yeah, those are, are um, things that we have to deal with. Um, but the fact is, is that Paul, Paul's gone through so much worse, and yet he still proclaims the name of Christ and says, I count this all joy. And he says, I am so excited. Praise be to God for, for where I'm at, uh, for what I'm able to, be to, able to be doing for his name's sake. And so our response to, to God is the same, should be the same as Paul's, that we should be praising him, saying to him be glory forever and ever. Paul communicates these uh, in the last few verses, he, he wraps up with these final greetings, a final request, um, and some encouragement to, uh, to Timothy as well. Um, he's saying, you know, greet these people. These people love you. Um, I, I want to see these people. They, uh, these people that I saw over here, they want to let you know that they're still praying for you. Um, Paul is still very much ministry-minded, even up to the end, right as he knows that so, sometime very soon I'm going to be executed. Um, sometime very soon um, it's going to be the end. Please come quickly. I would love to be able to see you again before that, that happens. Um, but if not, we love you, you know. And he says, the Lord be with you in spirit. Grace be with you. And so I think it's interesting here. The, the, final, the final communication that Paul is giving to Timothy is um, nothing short of just praise to God for the situations he's in. He recognizes that he wants this fellowship. He is alone. Things can be better. And yet 
God still deserves all the glory and praise. And so we want to respond to God, recognizing that we need to feel, recognize that God's presence is with us, and we want to feel that presence. We are never alone. We want to be firm in God's strength. Uh, even though we are weak, God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. We want to find peace in God's protection, have joy in God's preservation. So next week, we're going to be uh, praying through uh, a few of the key topics in 2 Timothy. I'm really excited about that. Um, whenever we have the opportunity to do that, I, I always um, am very much encouraged by uh, the things that we are, are praying about and the way that the Holy Spirit answers um, us. And so as we're closing out now, I want us to just be in remembrance to the fact that God is constantly with us, never forsaking us. We can always have that peace. And it's a matter of, of recognizing um, that shift in our hearts. So, Father, we want to thank you. We want to praise you. Um, you are so wonderful, so good to us. Thank you that you never leave us, never forsake us. Uh, thank you that you protect us and hold us with your hand. Um, Lord, we want to praise you for every circumstance that is going on. Lord, no matter whether it's our, our car is breaking down or there's difficulty with, um, with family members, uh, no matter whether or not there's um, financial troubles or we don't know um, what's going to happen next in our life, whether we're sick or, or we're lonely or there's difficulty at work, all of these things, Lord, you are present with us and we can have your peace. And so, Lord, please give us patience. We love you so much. And as we're worshiping you today, we just want to lift up your name. To you be glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name we pray.